me do this. Can everybody see the slide? I'm gonna yes. take that as easy. All right, thank you. <laughs> it's always it's always hard to know if you know the right thing is showing and people can hear you. So many technical glitches. So, uh, so obviously I'm I'm David Woods. Uh, I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Medicine, Division of Medical Medical Oncology. Uh, I joined uh, CU back in April. Uh, before that, I was a postdoc at NYU Lingo Medical Center, working with Jeff Weber, uh, who's a physician scientist doing a lot of work in melanoma immunotherapy, which you'll see is what I also do a lot of work in. Uh, and I was also co-mentored by Pratip Chattopadhyay, who is a uh, flow cytometry and single cell high dimension technology guru, which uh, really appealed to my, my tech side of things. Uh, and my graduate work was at Moffitt Cancer Center slash uh, University of slash South Florida School of Medicine. I worked with uh, Eduardo Sotomayor, who is known for his work in histone deacetylases. So obviously this topic, uh, it was inspired by my work there. Uh, I continued working in that field a little bit after. So uh, I'll share some of the stuff I've done uh, starting actually in my graduate work and then continuing throughout my postdoc and it's actually still projects I'm working on today. So, uh, and also please feel free at any time to interrupt and ask questions. We'll keep it a little more informal. So, all right, let's get this going. Minimize this. All right, here we go. So just a little background on epigenetics uh, and just getting you into the, the flow of things. So three main mechanisms of epigenetics uh, that is controlling gene expression uh, is DNA methylation, which is a silencing mark. So DNA that's methylated is typically silenced. There's histone methylation. So the, the histones, those are an octamer of proteins that DNA wraps around uh, and methylation of the histone tail residues uh, controls expression through epigenetics as well. Histone methylation is a bit of a mixed bag. Uh, so you can have mono, dye, and trimethylations at different residues, and those effects are, are dependent on the type of methylation, the residue, the gene. So it's a mix, mixed bag as far as being gene silencing or gene activating, we'll call it. Uh, and then histone acetylation, which is what we'll talk about basically for the remainder of this talk, is, is pretty straightforward. Uh, acetylation of histone tails is a, a gene uh, permissive state. So acetylation generally associates with activation or transcriptional activation rather of the associated gene region. So why epigenetics uh, in cancer patients? So this is some unpublished work I did a few years ago where we took a, a fairly unique sample. This is tumor resected from metastatic melanoma patients who went on to receive tumor infiltrating lymphocyte adoptive cell therapy. So that's one of the early uh, immunotherapies that's proven to be really successful, just hard to commercialize. And the reason I'm showing this data is just to show you, we profiled those tumor sections, including the immune infiltrate for a, a host of different epigenetic regulatory genes. Uh, this was done by nanostring. So what you're looking at is mRNA expression. Uh, and what we found was there was quite a significant number of genes that differentiated patients who went on to respond from those who didn't respond, including DNA methyltransferases, histone methyltransferases, uh, and histone deacetylases. Uh, and then, you know, when you cluster this, you actually get a nice clustering. Uh, these data, again, are unpublished. It's a unique data set and was hard to validate, so we haven't gone anywhere with that. But the whole point of this slide is to show you that epigenetic dysregulation uh, really ties into probably the aggressiveness of melanoma, the immune response, and a lot of other things. Uh, so looking at what we call the histone code, uh, this is you know, the, the, the octamer, the histone octamer you're seeing here illustrated, the eight different proteins there, uh, and then the tails, which are drawn uh, actually with their amino acid residues represented. And this is where the action happens when it comes to epigenetics. So these residues can be methylated, which is these purple methylations here, and they can be methylated at various residues, uh, and they can be acetylated uh, at lysine residues. And that's what we're gonna be focusing on is, is acetylation. I actually went through and, and sketched this out and started to put in all of the different uh, histone methyltransferases and demethylases to, to catalog all the epigenetics marks and how they can be modified. And it's just staggering uh, the amount of regulation that occurs here. 
But with regards to acetylation, again, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, and the idea is that a histone deacetylase, which we'll be talking about, removes the acetyl group from the lysine residues of these histone tails, which then exposes the positive charged histone tails to the negatively charged DNA, which causes it to condense into heterochromatin and in turn decreases gene accessibility. So what happens is when you use HDAC inhibitors, you increase the acetylation of these histones, decrease the DNA interaction, you end up with euchromatin and increase gen gene accessibility. Pretty straightforward. Oh, wrong direction. Uh, so histone deacetylases, there, there are two main classes. There's the zinc dependent HDACs, which I'll be talking primarily about. And then there's the, the class three known as the sirtuins. Uh, the the class the zinc dependent HDACs uh, are classical HDACs are further divided into subgroups of one, two A, two B, and class four. So class one, two A, two B, two, and four. Uh, so class one are really the true HDACs. These are the ones that regulate the the acetylation of the lysine tails and the histone uh, tails. Whereas two A, two B, and, and well, actually, four is also got nuclear activity, but two A and two B, these are these are a little more promiscuous. They post translationally modify a lot of proteins uh, and don't have much actual histone deacetylase activity. So these are the the true HDACs, if you will. I made this table uh, a few years ago, and it's way out of date. It was out of date then, and it's much more now. Trying to catalog all of the inhibitors of uh, histone deacetylases, there is a lot. Uh, they have different specificities, different potencies. For instance, you have what are known as pan-HDAC inhibitors, and as the name implies, these inhibit pretty much all of the HDACs. So uh, panabinostat, which we'll talk quite a bit about, is a good example of that, appropriately named for its pan-histone uh, deacetylase inhibition. And then you have, uh, in more recent years, more specific inhibitors. So you hear a lot of terms of specific or selective inhibitors. So things like atinostat, which is is being tested in various clinical trials as a class one inhibitor. So it doesn't have spillover into like the class 2A or class 2B and no reported activity for class four. And then you have things like 2A inhibitors. And then more recently, you've got HDAC specific inhibitors. So things like an HDAC3 specific inhibitor, an HDAC8 specific inhibitor. And I think arguably the one that is most explored in the literature is HDAC6 specific inhibitors mainly because these are just easier to manufacture because of HDAC6 being unique and having two deacetylase pockets in the protein. So that's been easy to exploit uh, with the biochemistry to inhibit these. Several HDAC inhibitors are FDA approved uh, exclusively in hematological malignancies. So panabinostat is approved in multiple myeloma, a couple indications for CTCL uh, with, with arenostat, uh, ramadepsin, and actually one of the first approvals was, uh, was valpuric acid, which was approved for neurological disorders, including seizures, bipolar disorder, and migraines. That was quite a long time ago. So a few approvals, uh, hematological malignancies, and they're mainly approved for their, their cytotoxicity, direct tumor cytotoxicity. So all those HDAC inhibitors and their specificities, they're determined in cell-free uh, enzyme assays where you use different reporters, but you're using free protein. Uh, and the problem with that is it really doesn't give you an indication of the specificity in cells. So what we've worked on a little bit over the years is determining actual HDAC inhib inhibitor specificity in cells. Uh, so what you can see here is two time points where we did a Western blot for a few things, and I'll explain it here. So what we did was we looked at acetylated histone three so increases in histone acetylated, acetylated histone three is gonna be indicative of class one HDAC inhibition. So you can see things like LBH589, which is another name for panabinostat at two hours, you have upregulation of cells treated with that in acetylated histone three. Uh, and then here's your total histone three control. So that would definitely have class one inhibition. And another readout you can look at is acetylated alpha-tubulin. Alpha-tubulin acetylation is a target of HDAC6. Uh, so you can see not a little bit of upregulation at two hours, but when you look at ACY1215, which has a reported HDAC6 inhibition, you can see that robust increase in acetylated alpha-tubulin. So when it comes to determining actual HDAC inhibitor specificities in cells, these are the main targets you can really evaluate is acetylated histone three for class one effects and acetylated alpha tubulin for HDAC6 specific effects. So that kind of limits you with determining specificity in cells, but it gives you a little bit of leeway. 
So moving on to some actual data looking at the effect of HDAC inhibitors in melanoma. So one of the first things we reported was that when you use uh, HDAC inhibitors, so in this case, we evaluated three, LBH589, TSA, and MGCD0103. So these are pan-HDAC inhibitors and a class one inhibitor. And what you can see is three melanoma cell lines, a murine and two human murine uh, melanoma cell lines, in which we treated with different doses uh, of these inhibitors, and they decreased the growth of those melanomas. So HDAC inhibitors have pretty potent effects on melanoma growth or viability. In fact, when you look at the, the panabinostat, you can see that at 12 nanomolars were having an impact on viability. That's quite a low dose. Uh, where things like MGCD0103, also known as mosatinostat, you, you have to get up in the micromolar range to really get an impact. But still, these are doses that are achievable, at least to a point here, in patients. So focusing more on panabinostat, LBH589, we evaluated a larger group of melanoma cell lines with different mutational statuses and found that it's pretty much the same story with a little bit of variation where low nanomolar doses inhibited cell growth. What was most interesting, I think, for me at least, was that when we used a non-transformed uh, melanocyte cell line, it really didn't impact uh, the, the viability or cell counts in the end. So it seems to be selective for transformed cells. So characterizing HDEC inhibitors and their effects on tumor growth, uh, cell counts, viability, so on and so forth, what we found was that uh, a variety of effects were actually going on. So in this case, again, we're looking at panabinostat, uh, 25 and a 50 nanomolar dose compared to our DMSO vehicle control, three melanoma cell lines. And you can see, uh, especially in this middle cell line, quite a robust increase in annexin-5 staining, which is indicative of apoptosis. So that you get inversion of annexin-5, it becomes expressed on the cell surface, and then you can stain for it by photocytometry. And then you can see that you know, those cells, are, they're on their way to death through apoptosis. And you can see that occurs in all the cell lines we tested here to varying degrees. And then this last quadrant, is actually uh, double positive. So they have the viability die and annexin. So these are fully dead cells. Uh, further confirmation, when you look by flow, uh, Western blot at Cleve PARP, you do indeed see upregulation of Cleve PARP to an apoptosis indicator uh, with low nanomolar doses of panabinostat. And accompanying this apoptosis, you see cell cycle arrest, you get a G1 arrest, uh, two cell lines shown here when you treat with the two doses uh, of panabinostat. So we've got apoptosis and cell cycle arrest, but I think what's arguably more important or critical is how these drugs alter the immunogenicity of melanoma and other tumor cell lines, especially as we're in the age of immunotherapy. And what happens is you get an upregulation of quite a lot of immunogenic, immunogenic markers on melanoma. Again, we're looking at these three cell lines and various markers here. So the, the shaded in gray is the autofluorescence background, and then the light gray outline is DMSO and panabinostat in black. And what you can see is there's an upregulation of MHC1, MHC2, CD40, CD80, and then to a degree not so great, CD86. So the takeaway is there's altered cell surface expression of immunologically important uh, molecules on the surface of melanoma when you treat with this HDAC inhibitor. So we've got cell death and we've got altered immunogenicity. Also, and accompanying that, we see increased expression of defined melanoma antigens. So this was done by QRT-PCR and then normalized to the DMSO controls, where we looked at four defined melanoma antigens, GP100, MART1, TYRP1, and 2. And you can see quite a bit of upregulation, somewhere up to, in some cases, 250 or greater fold increase in expression of those, those markers. And you know this is all neat and descriptive, but what matters is, does it actually end up activating T cells more? And the answer is yes. So we pre-treated, uh, I think in this case it was B16 with LBH589, and then co-cultured after washing it off with uh, mel um, uh, sorry, murine T cells, and then measured by ELISA upregulation of interferon gamma and IL-2, and you can see that you know, there definitely is an increased expression of interferon gamma and IL-2 by the co-cultured T cells. So they appear, these melanomas that are treated with LBH5A9 appear to be better at activating a, a T cell anti-tumor response. 
So one of the things we also noticed was upregulated on the surface of melanomas when we treated with HDAC inhibitors was pdl one expression. Uh, so what you're looking at here is a lot of different cell lines where we treated with three different inhibitors, MS-275, which is a class one inhibitor, LBH-589, again, our pan HDAC inhibitor, and MGCD-0103 or mosatinostat, which is a class one slash four inhibitor. And what you notice is to varying degrees in cell lines, you have initial expression of pdl one So, if, you know, you have like WM1366 has robust expression of pdl one where WM793, not so much. But in all cases, when you treat with any of these three inhibitors, you see upregulation to varying degrees of pdl one expression on the surface of these tumor cell lines. Uh, interesting, I, B78H1 is a variant of B16 that is interferon gamma insensitive, just if you're wondering. So we also did this same evaluation of different HDAC inhibitors on melanoma derived from patients. So these were resected tumors from patients. We froze them down, uh, then thawed them out later and treated them in vitro with different HDAC inhibitors to measure the effects on pd one expression. So three patients shown, uh, and what you can see is DMSO control. This is the MFI value of pd one expression with the vehicle control and then varying HDAC inhibitors. So PDX101 is a PAN HDAC inhibitor known as Belenistat. And again, our three uh, other inhibitors, PAN, class one, class one, class four. And all four of these inhibitors have a dose dependent upregulation for the most part, and some variation in PDL1 expression on these patient derived tumors. When we also treated with ACY1215, which is an HDAC6 inhibitor, next to Restat, which is another HDAC6 and PCI, 34051, which is an HDAC8 inhibitor, we didn't really see this. So it seemed to be that you had to have some inhibition of true HDACs, class 1 HDACs, be it through pan HDAC inhibition with these two or class 1 specific, class 1 slash 4 specific. In addition to PDL1 upregulation with HDAC inhibitors, we saw upregulation of PDL2, not quite as robust, but definitely consistently there. So again, this seems to be driven by a class one HDAC inhibition effect, and again, dose dependent. Uh, so this also happens in vivo. So everything I showed you previous was cell lines and patient derived uh, melanomas treated in vitro. So we went to a murine B16 model. We treated these mice with, in this case, again, panabinostat and then resected their B16 tumors and measured PD-L1 and PD-L2 by flow. And indeed, when treated in vivo, we get the same upregulation of PD-L1 and PD-L2. So we went looking for a mechanism. The obvious candidate is changes in histone accessibility. So uh, in an assay, I think was pretty neat. We designed primers that probed the the PDL1 and PDL2 gene regions. So this is all based on the proximity to exon one. So we went upstream. So this would be expect where you'd find promoter by, uh, transcription factors that are promoting the expression to bind and then into the gene itself. Uh, and then we treated with uh, either LBH. Uh, this is shown as ACY1215. The bar actually isn't there. We removed it for the final publication. This actually slipped, slipped in. Uh, and the takeaway here is that when you treat with LBH589, histone acetylation does indeed increase at the PDL1 and lesser at the PDL2 gene promoter regions. Uh, spoiler here for ACY1215, which we didn't show, uh, it didn't affect it at all. And that's kind of our negative control in this experiment because we also didn't see upregulation in actual surface protein. And again, we just took a wide variety of cell lines probed at this at this spot and then looked at the difference between treated and untreated cells. And it's the same story. It looks like LBH589 is driving increased gene accessibility uh, in the promoter region. Uh, this is actually, I should have mentioned from the start, uh, chip seek for acetylated histone 3. So upregulation here is increased acetylated histone 3, uh, not ATAC seek, which I don't think was really popular back then and would have probably been much easier to do, but nevertheless. Uh, and of course, you know, you have gene uh, accessibility increases through acetylated histone 3 increases, but that doesn't necessarily mean increased gene expression. You need to verify still. And yes, indeed, we did see increased expression to PDL1 uh, looking at mRNA levels uh, with different time courses of LBH589 treatment. In fact, it goes out quite far. This incre keeps increasing for quite some time. I didn't show the kinetic data with actual surface protein expression, but it continues to go up to about 96 hours. 
uh, and then it remains fairly high after. And again, different cell lines, same story. So the story is uh, you take a class one or a pan HDAC inhibitor, it increases gene uh, a histone acetylation at the PDL1 and PDL2 gene regions, which in turn drives expression of PDL1 and PDL2 on the surface of melanomas. One of the things that uh, the reviewers asked when we submitted this paper was uh, what about other epigenetic modifying agents, particularly DNA methyltransferase inhibitors? So uh, in the supplemental of that publication, you can actually find this where we took uh, three different DMT inhibitors and treated melanomas to see upregulation of pd one and PDO2. And actually, azacitidine and dizatabine actually do upregulate pd one and PDO2 expression in these cell lines. So um, it probably is, you know, an epigenetic silencing thing that can be done through histone acetylation or DNA methyltransfer base uh, activity, which isn't surprising because uh, DMNTs recruit HDACs and they work in concert to silence genes. Uh, some unpublished data, we actually started looking at this effect in non-melanoma cancer cell lines. So we, we kind of probed everyone we could find uh, at, at the, this was back in the Moffat days, uh, at, that was on the same floor as us for their different cell lines. And we just started treating them and evaluating pdl one expression. Uh, and what we found was that different uh, cancer cell lines do upregulate pdl one the, the the, there's some differences in what agents upregulate uh, PDL1 between the cell lines, but it's definitely there. It's definitely happening with all of the different uh, the different sorry malignancies we evaluated. So ovarian, pancreatic, lung, breast, and the bottom is all actually uh, hematological malignancies, AML, multiple myeloma, another AML, and CBCL. Uh, so we actually included additional inhibitors in this. So we've got our Kind of our controls here, which we don't expect to upregulate PDL1, uh, and then our class ones and slash four that do upregulate uh, LBH is in here, and then we used an HDAC3 inhibitor. Uh, our hypothesis was that some of this was mediated by HDAC3. Used uh, DNA methyltransferase inhibitors, and we started evaluating some methyl uh, histomethylase inhibitors, and found some interesting results with that. So the takeaway here is from these unpublished data, this effect is not specific to melanoma. It appears to be uh, that any any cancer cell line, at least uh, that's treated with different epigenetic uh, inhibiting agents, can upregulate PDL1. So going back to the actual implications of this, the the obvious thing was. Well, if you're upregulating PDL1, you probably want to throw in a PD1 blocking antibody in combination to circumvent some of that potentially immunosuppressive effects. So we've got all these data that suggest the HDAC inhibitors are directly cytotoxic to, to melanoma. We've got in, uh, data that says that they upregulate uh, the immunogenicity, which results in an enhanced T cell response. But then we also have data that says that it upregulates PDL1, which could potentially dampen some of that T cell response. So we went in. And we did a B16 murine model where we combined panabenistat, our favorite up to this point, with a PD1 blocking antibody and measured tumor growth over time. Uh, and this is pretty well established. Anti PD1 as a single agent in a B16 model is not active. And that's the same thing we saw. It just doesn't do anything. Uh, when you treat with LBH589 uh, by itself, you do decrease tumor progression. And then in combination, you get further increase which to me suggests that since you don't see activity as a single agent, but you do see increased activity in combination, the LBH589 is increasing the immunogenicity of B16 in a way that actually makes it responsive. That's a hypothesis and would have to have more supporting data, but I think these data do suggest that. So where do you go with all this? Well, you wanna eventually take it to a patient. That's, that's kind of the point. Uh, so. Years ago, there was a phase one started uh, at Moffitt Cancer Center and combining panabenistat with ipilimumab. Uh, this is back in the days before nivolumab was approved. Uh, so it kind of from the start was at a disadvantage because this was around the time where Nevo was starting to emerge as very effective, but we didn't combine that. Uh, we combined panabenistat with ipilimumab, which is the CTLA-4 blocking antibody. 17 patients got treated. Uh, 11 of them had grade three or greater toxicity. That's pretty high. That's unsurprising with pan HDAC inhibition. They do have really nasty side effects in, in patients. 
But ultimately it was sort of a, a bust because the patient response rates were just not great. Uh, didn't have much in the way of responses, no complete responses uh, and mostly progressive disease. So I guess in hindsight, that's not too surprising because what we found was that panabinostat uh, impairs T cell viability. So this is looking at different inhibitors, uh, treating T cells derived from metastatic melanoma patients in vitro, and then evaluating viability at different doses. And the one guy that sticks out as having really poor effects on T cell viability is LBH589. And then actually in some unpublished data, we found the same thing mice, we, we treated mice, uh, tumor-bearing mice with LBH589, did some CBCs, and then looked at lymphocyte counts and found that LBH589 treated mice did have lower levels of circulating lymphocytes, uh, suggesting that it may be impairing the viability of those T cells in vivo in a manner we saw similar to in vitro. This doesn't seem to be unique to LBH589. It seems to be the effect of pan HDAC inhibition on T cells. So what we did was we took different melanoma uh, patient frozen PBMC isolated T cells uh, and then treated uh, it in vitro with different inhibitors with different specificities and measured viability. And in fact, what you can see is quite clear that LBH589 really impairs T cell viability, Saha uh, and quesinostat, valinostat, they have pretty negative effects as well. But when you start getting into the more specific inhibitors, uh, class one, class two, HDAC6, uh, HDAC3 and HDAC8, they really don't have such a detrimental effect. Uh, a little bit, but not so much of a detrimental effect as you see with pan-HDAC inhibition on T cell viability. And uh, it's not just viability, it's function. So we probed the cytokine secre secretion profile of T cells from patients treated with, well, treated in vitro with panabinostat and found that there was decreases in pretty much everything. IL-4, IL-6, IL-10, IL-2, interferon gamma, TNF. It's not surprising you're impairing viability. Uh, when you look in intracellular flow, it's much the same story. It just kind of clogs up and impairs the T cell function. So that said, we, we wanted to start looking at the effects of more specific inhibitors uh, that did not impair T cell viability and start evaluating what we could do with those. Uh, and what we initially landed on was looking at these HDAC6 quote unquote selective inhibitors uh, because they did not impair T cell viability. So ACY1215 and 241 are reported as HDAC6 inhibitors but in our hands, at least on T cells, you do see that inhibition profile of increased acetylated alpha tubulin with ACY 1215, same thing with 241 not shown, uh, which indicates it has HDAC6 inhibition. Uh, but we also saw increased levels of acetylated histone 3, which is indicative of class 1 inhibition. So I don't know that I would call this an HDAC6 specific inhibitor. I'd call it more of an HDAC6 selective inhibitor. Uh, just as controls, you can see this is a class 1, 4 inhibitor, no effects on alpha tubulin, loads of effects on acetylated histone 3, and then tubostatin A is a well-known HDAC6 inhibitor. You can see that it's got clear increases in acetylated alpha tubulin and really not much in the way of acetylated histone 3, maybe a little smidge there. So profiling the effects of these HDAC6 selective inhibitors uh, on T cells, what we found was that they decreased T cell TH2 functions. So again, profiling cytokine secretion, we found decreases in IL-4, 5, 6, 10, 13 with these two inhibitors. Uh, looking at tubostatin A, which is again an HDAC6 specific inhibitor, you don't really see the same profile. You see a couple overlaps, IL-5 and IL-13, but not the same inhibition profile. And then MS-275, which is a class one inhibitor, Again, IL-13 seems to be just inhibited by everything. Uh, IL-10 actually goes up with MS-275 and then not so much effects on these others. And what we found was that these two compounds, the ACY compounds were substantially decreasing the expression of GATA3, the uh, canonical TH2 transcription factor in both CD4s shown here and CD8s not shown. Uh, so this kind of led us to a conundrum because HDAC6 inhibition was previously shown to increase the suppressive function of Treg. 
So uh, this is uh, Wayne Hancock's group showing a Treg suppression assay with wild type Tregs. And you can see you titrate in Tregs, they suppress proliferation. Uh, this is your no Treg group. And then you titrate in HDEX6 knockout Tregs and they suppress the proliferation even better than their wild type counterparts. Uh, and then GVHD model, unsurprisingly, when you have uh, wild type Tregs, you get GVHD, but when you have HDEX6 knockouts, they, they, they prevent GVHD. And you can get the same thing by using Tubasin, which is an HDEX6 specific inhibitor. So HDEX6 has been previously shown in this work and others to, to inhibition rather of HDEX6 to increase the suppressive function of Tregs. And we had an HDEX6 selective inhibitor. So we were kind of afraid that it would be, you know, countering our a TH2 down regulation by increasing Treg function, but that was not the case. Uh, in fact, what we found was that it decreased the, the suppressive function of Treg. So it reduced the expression of FOXP3. So you're looking at FOXP3 expression in treated T cells in vitro again uh, by flow. So an FMO, DMSO, and then the ACY, you can see a reduction to about half uh, or even less uh, the levels of FOXP3 expression control versus the control, which in the end ends up resulting in reduced suppression by those Tregs. So this is a co-culture uh, of autologous Tregs and CD8s. The Tregs are pre-treated with ACY1215, that's the, the orange line here, and then DMSO in black, and then the no Treg group in shaded gray. You pre-treat them, you wash them, and then you co-culture them with polyclonal CD3, CD28 stimulation, uh, with CD8s, and you measure this, the KI67 expression as a proliferation surrogate in the CD8s. So in other words, you can see that there's a lot of proliferation in the ACY 1215 treated Treg group of the CD8s, and not so much with the DMSO. So nice suppression, not so, much, not so suppressive anymore. So ACY 1215 uh, was decreasing the suppressive function of Tregs. And in fact, we did another type of assay where you take naive CD4s, you polarize them to a Tregg phenotype. Uh, in this case, we did it in the presence of ACY1215 or 241. Same type of deal, you co-culture them with CD8s from the same patient, and then measure this suppressive function at, through KI67 expression on the CD8 group. And you can see that the ACY-treated Tregs, or ITregs rather, they just don't suppress as well as the DMSO control. So despite the, the HDX6 inhibition profile of a, these ACY compounds, they were impairing Treg function, not enhancing it, which in hindsight is explanatory uh, through the class one inhibition that's been widely reported that class one inhibitors decrease the Treg and suppressive function. So we, we kept profiling the effects on T cells uh, with these compounds. And what we found was that when you cultured long-term with these inhibitors, you had increases in central memory phenotypes uh, on the T cells. So looking at CD62L, CD45RA, CD45RO, and CCR7, we found that in a dose-dependent manner, there was increases in this phenotype of central memory, both CD4s and CD8s, uh, when, they, when you culture with these compounds. And these bottom graphs are actually several patients we we, these were actually tumor infiltrating lymphocytes harvested from metastatic melanoma patients. And we expanded them in vitro using the same protocol they use in the clinic, which is high dose IL-2 over the period of weeks. And in this case, we spiked in ACY 1215 and then evaluated the phenotype. And yes, indeed, we saw the same thing where there's an increase in the central memory phenotype of the T cells expanded in the presence of ACY 1215. Other effects we saw were a decrease in exhaustion, quote unquote, phenotypes. So these are, uh, these are phenotypes that have been reported to be associated with exhaustion. So things like cells triple expressing PD-1, LAG-3, and TIM-3, we saw decreases in that. We saw decreases in cells expressing both PD-1 and EOMAS, which is another, a quote unquote, exhaustion phenotype. Uh, and then inversely, we saw increases in functional phenotypes. So cells that express PD-1 and TBET, uh, were increased with the ACY treatments. Uh, and I guess ultimately you had increases in cells that were able to uh, express TNF and interferon gamma, which would be indicative of, of less exhaustion, more function when they're cultured with these compounds. So uh, it appears that when you treat T cells or expand T cells in the presence of these HDX6 selective inhibitors, 
it skews their function towards an inflammatory anti-tumor response and away from an immunosuppressive TH2 Treg type response. Uh, and that's supported by this data showing that till cultured and expanded in the presence of these compounds have increased uh, cytolytic profile that is double positive interferon gamma CD107A. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, and at the end of the day, what really matters is do they kill better? And the answer is yes. T cells expanded in the presence of these compounds uh, and then assessed for cytotoxicity in a mixed lymphocyte reaction do in fact kill their target cells better. So all these phenotypes do end up resulting in increased uh, cytolytic function. So a lot of uh, descriptive data there, but we went fishing for an explanatory mechanism. Uh, so we did, in this case, ATAC-seq, which is, uh, it, it's, a, it's a pretty straightforward method for looking at chromatin accessibility, not necessarily histone acetylation marks. So you don't look for acetylated histone three by chip seq or anything like that. You just look at complete chromatin accessibility, gene accessible and inaccessible regions. Uh, and you can see there was quite a few significant peaks that were upregulated in ACY1215 T cells, and then a few that were actually downregulated, which is interesting uh, with an HDAC inhibitor, but I don't think it's unexpected. So giving you just a little bit of a gene view here of accessibility for these different regions, one of the ones that was statistically significant was TBET. So we showed some protein data back there showing TBET was enhanced in ACY treated cells. And in fact, we do see increased histone accessibility or chromatin accessibility rather in the treated cells. Uh, interferon gamma also increased, CD45RO, CCR7, these were all increased in the ACY treated group. Uh, doing a pathway analysis to get some hints. Uh, one of the things that showed up for the open chromatin regions was association with T cell receptor signaling. So we went back and did an in vitro assay where we treated T cells and looked for phosphorylation of CD3 epsilon, uh, which is obviously part of the, the CD3 signaling pathway, and didn't, didn't find that there was, there was upregulation and phosphorylation of CD3 epsilon and activated T cells that were treated with ACY1215 and increased CD69, which is an early activation marker. So it does appear that ACY uh, is increasing T cell signaling and, and activation of T cells. Looking at decreased uh, peaks here, we found the number one hit was mTOR signaling pathways, which looking through the literature kind of makes sense. Uh, so uh, mTOR can be part of two complexes, mTORC1 or mTOR complex one and mTORC2. Uh, and there's various things that associate with these mTOR proteins and then downstream molecules that regulate a lot of the phenotypes we saw. For instance, Raptor uh, regulates Treg suppressive function positively. Uh, HIF1 alpha decreases the expression of CD62. L, CCR7, SGK1 is involved with TH2 polarization. So these are little hints that we were, the phenotypes we're seeing could be related to suppression of this pathway. So what we did was we went back and we ran flow looking for phosphorylation of the various markers that were part of these complexes and downstream, immediately downstream of them and did find that ACY1215 and 241 treated T cells had decreases in phosphorylation of these molecules, suggesting that, that one of the mechanisms, potential mechanisms is indeed silencing of mTOR signaling or decreased mTOR signaling. Uh, just as kind of a little confirmation or to, to lend evidence to it, we, we took uh, T cells and treated them again with ACY1215. And we also used this SGK1 inhibitor, which uh, is part of the, the TH, this is controlling TH2 polarization. And then we evaluated the cytokine production profile and indeed uh, ACY, again, as we showed earlier, decreased IL-4 and IL-6 production where this GSK, or SGK1 inhibitor also did uh, to a lesser degree. So, so potentially ACY compounds are having at least part of their effect through downregulation of mTOR signaling. Uh, another group actually beat us to the punch with that and they, they published uh, some of very similar data showing uh, a, a similar mechanism. So it's nice when other groups have something independent that confirms what you, your hypothesis is. So we we were moving on from the, the Panabinistat trial and instead we, th there was a, a phase one trial started combining ACY1241. This is 
was arguably the superior of the two inhibitors and has a better uh, bioavailability profile. So this has been what they've evaluated in the clinic. Uh, combining that with IPI and NEVO for metastatic melanoma, active disease patients, stage three, stage four. So I wish I had something to show you here, but what ended up happening with this trial was there was one patient enrolled and then Acetylon, the company that makes this compound and was part of this trial, uh, was bought by it was bought up and the, the company that bought them had no interest in continuing with the trial and promptly shut it down, which is very disappointing. So we, uh, we started working a few years, uh, around the same time actually, uh, with a company known as Marathi Therapeutics who makes uh, Mosatinostat, which is a class one, class four inhibitor. Uh, it's pretty unique in that it has inhibition of class four, but it is not a pan h -tech inhibitor. I don't think there's any others that I know of that has class four inhibition without being a pan HDAC inhibitor. So why care about class four inhibition? Well, first off, HDAC 11 is the only member of the class four HDACs. Uh, and the reason for interest is in inhibiting HDAC 11 is because we published some data a few years ago showing that HDAC 11 regulated the uh, histone acetylation of the EOMS and TBET gene promoter regions in T cells and thereby regulated their inflammatory function. So in resting T cells, you're gonna have uh, acetyl uh, de acetylation by HDAC11 of the gene promoter regions of EOMS and TBET. And then when you activate a cell, what we found was HDAC11 leaves that area, allowing for chromatin accessibility uh, and downstream transcription of EOMS and TBET. Uh, we knocked out HDAC11 in a MURI model and did all these uh, analyses of their T cell function. And I'll spare you for t the sake of time of all that. But what we found in the end was that uh, HDAC11 knockout T cells had a hyperinflammatory uh, phenotype. And they, in an adoptive cell uh, therapy model in B16, they mediated uh, a better anti tumor response, delaying tumor progression compared to wild type T cells. And of course, no T cell adoptive transfer. And arguably more importantly, what we found in a small number of patients, we profiled HDAC11 expression in, in the TIL product. We found that responders had lower levels of HDAC11. Uh, so HDAC11 is a potentially interesting target. The problem is there's no HDAC11 specific inhibitors, not to my knowledge. Uh, so we started playing with this mosatinostat drug and found that it had the same effects as we saw with other HDAC inhibitors. It decreases cell counts, uh, different doses evaluated here. Uh, it upregulated immunogenicity, so things like uh, HLA, ABC, or class one, class two expression. Uh, this, these both show that uh, PDL one, PDL two expression, really robust decreases in KI sixty seven expression, the proliferative surrogate marker uh, in melanomas. This is one cell line we're showing here at low doses. Increases in melan defined melanoma antigens. It fits the bill of what we saw with our pan HDAC inhibitor. Uh, in some very recent data, I got interested in the, these effects and induction of cell death and whether or not it was immunogenic. So we evaluated two immunogenic cell death markers. So that is cell death in a way that causes or elicits an immune response. Uh, so two defined markers are HSP70 and HMGB1 expression on the surface of melanomas. And what we found was that there was indeed an increase in surface expression of these two markers, uh, arguably a higher degree with HSP70 in treated cells, uh, suggesting that the, the death that results from HDAC and this HDAC inhibitor mosatinostat and probably others as well it is immunogenic. Uh, so did a cl collaboration and published a few years ago with Mar Marathi Therapeutics, the company that makes mosatinostat, showed that in a murine CT26 model, uh, that when you combine mosatinostat with a pd one blocking antibody, they're superior to either single agent. And of course, overall survival is better. Uh, and then when you look at infiltration in the, the tumors of these mice, there's increased uh, CD8s and decreased Tregs. So these were pretty compelling data that mosatinostat was augmenting an anti-tumor immune response. So with that, uh, we did another clinical trial. Uh, another phase one, and this time combining mosatinostat with ipi and nevo, again, patients unresectable stage three, stage four melanoma, uh, 10 patients treated total. Uh, this, this actually completed a little while ago. Uh, and I would argue that, you know, you can't make too much out of this because it's a small stage one, a phase one trial where this isn't the primary endpoint, but response rates were pretty, pretty good. 
seven out of 10 patients had a response, including two complete responses. Uh, and at two and a half years of follow-up, there's been no patient deaths. Uh, so, so evaluating the patient samples from this trial, what we found was unsurprisingly that patients while on treatment saw upregulation of acetylated histone threes in the CD3 compartment. This is looking at six different patients. You can see a couple of these don't have that trend, but uh, again, small numbers, hard to make sense of it. Um, but more so, we saw histone acetylation upregulation in the monocyte compartment, CD14 positive cells. Uh, again, this is the, a progressive disease patient colored in red. He, he bucks the trend there. Uh, looking at KI67 expression, we see a trend towards increased KI67 expression in CD4s and CD8s, as well as Tregs. Uh, so the important thing with this is this is probably driven all actually all of this by IPI and or NEVO, uh, the, the PD-1 blocking or CTLA-4 blocking antibodies. Uh, we've done an unpublished data result uh, analysis on single agent treated patients and found that, yeah, that IPI and NEVO drives expansion uh, or expression of KI-67, CD4s and CD8s. It also, in a publication we did publish, drives, uh, NEVO actually drives expansion of Tregs or at least cells with a Treg phenotype because what we find is that when you when you look at them and test their suppressive function, they don't suppress well. We didn't test the suppressive function uh, of the, the quote unquote Tregs in, in this trial uh, because of just limited act, a limited number of samples. Uh, so that wasn't really feasible. So these effects, are probably driven by the, the actual immunotherapy, but I would spin this in a positive light and say that we don't have impairment of T cell proliferation by our HDAC inhibitor. Uh, kind of going back and talk a little more about the Tregs, uh, most atenostat is definitely potent at inhibiting Treg function. Uh, so you can see at 250 nanomolars, which is below the level that actually gets in patients, there's basically complete ablation of FOXP3 expression uh, in the CD4 compartment. Uh, and then you have downregulation of dose-dependent mannitin of TGF-beta, LAP, GARP, these are Treg-associated uh, proteins. And then in IT rig suppression assays, MGCD uh, or MG5837, it's, it's the same thing, just different names for the compound. Uh, they, the Tregs treated with that do not suppress well. Uh, looking at the effects on T cells, uh, intracellular and secreted, uh, you have increases in CD107A, which is a degranulation marker, granzyme B, perforin, interferon gamma, and interferon gamma in the CD4 compartment. Uh, so MOSI seems to upregulate an inflammatory phenotype. Uh, looking at secreted uh, molecules, uh, cytokines and molecules in in vitro assays, granzyme A, B go up. That's not surprising. Interferon gamma, TNF but also decreases in IL-5 and IL-13. So that fits that class one inhibition profile uh, that we saw with the ACY data where TH2 is down, TH2 functions are downregulated with class one inhibition. Clinical specimens, the data fits the same trend. Again, limited number of samples. Uh, so statistical power is very limited, uh, but the, the trend is the same. Increases in granzyme A, uh, granzyme B, interferon gamma, and TNF levels in the serum of the patients, looking at baseline to on-treatment serum samples. Uh, unfortunately, IL-5 and IL-13 levels were below detection in the serum. So that was T-cells, but when I showed you the acetylation data, it showed that the, the main effects or the, the big effects were in the monocyte population, and we do see changes there too, where when you treat with mosatinostat, there's a downregulation of this M2-like phenotype, so cells expressing 163 and 206, and upregulation of an M1-like phenotype, cells expressing uh, CD80 and 86, and a downregulation of MDSC phenotypes. And again, going to the patients, we see the same exact trend. Uh, downregulation of an M2, upregulation of an M1-like, definite downregulation of, uh, actually statistically significant, even with the limited number of patients here, of MDSCs, and then downregulation of NOS2 expression, the effective molecule in those MDSCs. So it does seem to be impairing a immune suppressive uh, myeloid phenotype. So putting all of that together, uh, HDAC inhibitors have a lot of effects. Uh, directly on tumors, they impair their viability through induct inducing apoptosis, proliferative arrest. Uh, they also increase the tumor immunogenicity through increasing MHC, class one, class two expression various co-stimulatory molecules, including PDL1, PDL2, 
uh, antigen expression and, and maybe based on some pulmonary data, immunogenic cell death. But the end, pan h -deck inhibitors uh, are detrimental to T cells and probably other immune cells, uh, which isn't really, which I guess would make sense given that the, the inhibitors that are approved in hematological malignancies are pan h -deck inhibitors. So they probably do a good job of killing immune cells. Uh, well, this isn't true of selective or specific h -deck inhibitors. Uh, they don't really impact T cell viability, not to the same degree. So moving forward with the idea of combining with immunotherapy, I think that selective or specific HDAC inhibitors are the, probably gonna be the only way to go. Uh, and in addition to all the work that's shown that you can modulate tumors with uh, HDAC inhibitors, you can definitely modulate immune cell function. Uh, we, so we've shown a lot of that data. Uh, HDAC 11 is a very attractive target because of its uh, uh, regulation of EOMS and TBET and T cells, but there are no really good HDAC11 specific inhibitors, at least that I know of. It's, it's really hard to inhibit HDAC11 because of, of its structure uh, and similarity to the class one HDACs. Uh, but the class one slash four inhibitor, mostatinostat, is promising uh, in both in vitro, uh, in murine in vivo, and in patient uh, early phase clinical trials, uh, where we've seen reduced immunosuppressive immune phenotypes and a shift towards the balance of an anti-tumor immune phenotype. Uh, and I guess, you know, through everything I've learned working with HDAC inhibitors, it really is the right inhibitor at the right dose. Uh, the, the thing that's kind of bothered me is working with some of these companies, they, they have that old school mentality of do a phase one trial, find your max, maximum tolerated dose and go forward with that. But if you're using this as, a, as an adjuvant for immunotherapy, that probably isn't the best approach. Uh, just something to keep in mind. So obviously this wasn't all done alone. I had a a ton of people that you know helped out, uh, and so they deserve acknowledgments. Uh, the crew at NYU Langone, some of them have moved on. Uh, Jeff Weber, I continue to collaborate, great guy, former mentor. Uh, Moffa Cancer Center, back in my graduate days, made a lot of good friends there. Um, they have obviously all moved on as well. A subtle on, no, actually they're reforming this company. Very interesting story, but uh, a couple uh, colleagues that I uh, ended up becoming good friends with there, uh, Emirati as well. These guys are great. Uh, so they, these two make the different HDAC inhibitors. So thank you for your attention and your time. And hopefully some of that was of interest. Uh, David? Yeah. Uh, Eric Lemby, nice, nice talk. Thank uh, you. I'm curious in terms of the, the toxicity of the pan HDAC inhibitors and yet uh, mild toxicity with the individual, uh, with, the, with the more specific inhibitors, it, uh, what's the thinking in terms of why there's toxicity with, you know, is it a combination of one plus three? I mean, what, what's the logic for the toxicity with the pan HDAC inhibitors? Uh, so I'm not entirely sure. Speculatively, I think that a lot of it is driven by class one uh, inhibition because class one is going to be a ubiquitous thing. So histone acetylation, when you hit with, uh, when you hit with a histone deacetylase inhibitor that has class one or pan in, uh, profile, it, it alters the expression of about 20 to 30% of all genes. So that's going to be in all the cells throughout the entire body. So I, I can imagine that is probably the big driver of cytotoxicity or patient toxicity. Uh, Cause in, in the, the trials with class one inhibitors, you do see toxicity in patients still. I don't know that it's to the same degree. I'd have to double check that, but I don't think it's the same degree as you see with the pan. And arguably it's just because pan you got, you have more targets and more effects. So more, more, off-target toxicity. That's, you know, me speculating a little bit there. Sure. Thanks. No worries. So I think I may have bored everyone to sleep or, uh, gave the perfect presentation and there's no questions. <laughs> hey, David, 